Welcome to the Moms Making Six Figures podcast, where it's all about real women, real stories, real inspiration. And now your host and creator of Moms Making Six Figures, Heidi Bartolotta. Today, I'm here with Jessica Smith, tax strategist. Let's start out by talking about your background. I think it's, I, I like the way you described that you have been in tax your entire life. I think it's really <laughs> cute. So maybe talk about your background and how you ended up where you are today. So I am a tax season baby. My dad, in his very first year as a tax attorney, CPA kind of scenario, um, I was born March 24th on his first year as a tax professional. So you can imagine from the get-go, I was destined to be in this line of work. Um, And as I got into high school, he started to kind of pull me into the business, started to do accounting and, you know, minor little bookkeeping work here and there. And um, really, I had always thought I want to be a CPA, I want to be an accountant, did a couple other things in the midst, but ended up getting back into the business and have been a... uh, tax strategist now for about 12 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and my birthday still interferes with, <laughs> with the tax season <laughs> every single year. So no matter what, I get I get uh, crap from people sometimes for yeah. celebrating my birthday in the midst of tax season. They say, how can how can you have a birthday during you tax season? You have to season? do like the half birthday like you do with kids that aren't in school during their birthday yep. season. <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's the only way to celebrate it because otherwise people think it's very crazy to take any time off during oh, the tax yeah. season as a tax professional. Yeah. Wow. And you have three children. I do. I have a 14 and a half year old son, super sassy, but have to love him. And then I decided to take a 10 year break. And now I have a four and a half year old daughter and a 13 month old daughter. And those two keep me very, very busy. Yeah. So how, talk about your career with them. And I know you, you skipped over it a little bit, but you did some trend, you tested some other things before you ended up in tax, right? But what, what is that like with motherhood? Cause you've kind of had two seasons of motherhood, honestly. Yes. You're like starting over again, almost not totally, but kind of. <laughs> it did feel very much like starting over. So, you know, when my son was very, very young, um, I kind of, got in and out of college a few different times. I think I dropped out if I counted four or five times. I just wasn't sure that accounting was what I wanted to do. So Mm -hmm. I was trying just to get general education, see if there was something that would pique my interest. And I was working in escrow for many years. I did that for about eight years and then kind of grew my tax practice on the side as a little side hustle. Mm -hmm. Um, But escrow is just a very volatile Um, position. I mean, Mm -hmm. especially I made it through many, many layoffs at some of my other jobs. Um, A lot of the times a company would consolidate and, you know, merge with another one. And that just does not, I was, I didn't feel invested in that job. It was very, very insecure. And then, you know, at at one point, I believe I did get laid off on a couple different occasions. And I knew I had to take, take my career seriously, decide, is it accounting or is it something else? And then really got into accounting said, okay, this is what I'm doing. Fell in love with tax, which I did not expect because I just wanted to do public accounting. Mm-hmm. But tax, I excelled. Did great in all the tax stuff. Really grew my practice. Um, you know, really as a single mom, I had, you know, just gotten through a second divorce. And I was like, I need to be there for my son and make sure that we are able to get through this together. And I couldn't do that with a nine to five. So I was growing my business and actually took a couple years off to be able to do my business part-time and be with my son as full-time as possible. And then I got pretty lucky after he was settled in and getting into his new routine, was able to get a job at a big law firm and really grew my experience doing tax strategy and representation and all that. Um, And that kind of spearheaded making the jump into self-employment. So Mm -hmm. it's been a wild ride, but I've, I've enjoyed the process and my experiences in escrow and real estate really spearheaded some of the specialties that I perform now in my job. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I thought was really interesting when you and I were talking earlier and you talked about how your your practice really was essentially like a side hustle, so to speak, Mm -hmm. for quite a while until you decided to change it. 
And I think you talking about that might be really helpful for some of the women that are listening, because I think a lot of them probably have something that is a passion of theirs on the side that maybe they've never decided to completely go kind of full out in. And when you did that, your business just exploded. So, and you were a mother, a single mother at the time. So it wasn't, it wasn't probably the securest thing to do, but really it was, it ended up being the best thing for you. So will you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it was kind of a crazy story. So, you know, when I got into kind of like that corporate environment, I thought for sure that the best way to grow my business was to keep it a side hustle and then have the regular cash flow of a regular job Mm -hmm. to help me invest my business and grow my business. And so for probably six or seven years, that's what I was doing. It was a side hustle at that point, great extra money, but trying to fit in the client work when you're working nine to five was really, really difficult. But I, I made it work and I kept telling myself, if I just keep pushing and I keep having this regular money come in, I'll I'll get into that perfect investment that takes me to the next level. And it never really came. And so it was kind of like an indefinite side hustle. Um, and I was doing really, really well, but you get to a point where the side hustle can possibly be a full-time gig and it interferes with the full-time job. So you have to, you know, it's kind of like, you know, get off the pot, if that's the way to put it. And um, I actually chose a very inopportune time to go full time. I was a month from giving birth. The pandemic literally had just started. Um, and I, I left a, a firm and I was like, well, I have to make this work because I wasn't sure what childcare was going to look like at the time. Um, and just kind of, you know, went full force and said, I'm, I'm going to do this and I'm going to take this side hustle and make it a full-time thing. And, you know, there was a lot to learn very, very fast because no one really explains to you the difference between taking a side hustle to something full-time because you're no longer just doing the work and, you know, providing an okay level of customer service. Now you are the CEO, the CFO, the the customer service agent, the the client facing, you're everything. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn a lot of new things in order to bring my business to that level of probably professionalism that I really wanted to offer my clients and to also be able to grow and scale. And I did surprisingly very well in that first year. And now getting into my second year, um, I'm on track to triple what I earned um, last year. Mm -hmm. And I truly was was on the opinion that I needed the full-time job to scale the business. And the reality is the full-time job was holding me back from putting all of my time, energy, and passion into the job. So um, if if you re- truly want to make your passion your full-time income generator, sometimes you just have to let go of that security because you'll make decisions in a completely different manner than if you're like, oh, well, I always have that job to fall back on. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like cutting the cord. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of people have discussed about how Unfortunately, everything going on with COVID, it, it forced them to make some really difficult decisions. And for some of us, those pivots helped us take these jobs that, again, we've been working as side hustles for all these years into full-time work. And we're able to, you know, support our families and provide our families with lives we probably never imagined possible. Mm-hmm. So it's been, it's been an experience. I'm really happy to have made the jump when I did and put in the effort where it needed to go to get me where I'm at now. Mm-hmm. I think that there's a lot of lessons that you could teach in that because um, there is that point where you have to, I guess, just get off the fence, right? Like you need to choose which side you're going to be on or you're not going to do either of them well. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that very much goes to the jack of all trades and the master of none. Mm -hmm. And so in my experience, when I was working the full-time job, I was always really good at doing the work at the full-time job. And when the the scales kind of like put it more to like an even where the income from the side hustle was really taking over, you know, the, the work that I was performing at my regular job started to suffer. And so that is, that really was a pivotal point for me. Like what, what avenue is going to be the best fit for me? And I, you know, felt that I had been putting so much time and effort into the side hustle. I didn't want to just abandon everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, and so taking it full time was just really the right decision for me. Also probably in line with your character too, in providing, as you said, the kind of service and being what you wanted to be for your clientele. It's interesting. How did that impact your family overall? I think my husband was really nervous 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> I can imagine. We, you know, we always were somewhat similar in our income level. And so the idea of me walking away from a full-time, you know, salary expectation, mm -hmm. um, and I had just gotten a promotion just prior to leaving. Um, so he was looking at the income loss and he was like, how, how are we going to do this? Mm -hmm. And I said, I'll give it until this date. So I had a drop dead date. And if I didn't by that drop dead date have enough recurring income to make it possible, then I said, I'll go look for a full-time job. Um, and then that date came and went and we discussed it. And he was like, you're, you're happy. You're doing well financially. We're not in a position of struggling at the moment. We've made some adjustments to accommodate, you know, the loss of income overall. And he's like, I know you're going to do great things. So let's just keep riding the wave and see how it works. And it just, has paid off it's, in it's huge paid ways. Off. Yeah. yeah. And so he's probably one of my biggest supporters now, where before he might have been a little hesitant and just wanting to at least, you know, yeah. give me the opportunity to right. fulfill my passion. And now yeah. he's like, go for it. Dang, <laughs> like you're killing it. Yeah. You know? So we we have those conversations and we kind of joke, we have this healthy competition where, you know, in his line of work, he's able to earn commissions and I kind of have a unlimited opportunity to earn and so we always like hey what'd you what'd you do this week and so we're you know we're, we're, we're getting there where we're a little bit more neck and neck again so it's it's been a, a good experience but you definitely need to have a cheerleader on your side because it's yeah. lonely sometimes being a business oh, yeah. owner yeah so one of the questions that I ask all of my guests is podcast or book <laughs> um Shoot. I mean, I have, I struggle with words. So if it was a book, I'd have to hire someone to ghostwrite for me and I would just ramble on and ramble on and allow them to, to write something. I mean, reading. Reading. Oh, no, no. I uh, don't oh, really no. do either. Um, so funny thing about the line of work that I'm in, I read a lot. Uh -huh. Not because I want to, it's because I have to. Yeah. Continuing education. Um, yes. It's very, very detailed. So I really don't have a lot of time to read uh -huh. um, for pleasure. And I, my sister though, she could read Harry Potter front to back every single day and she'll just continue to read it over and over so she got that gene I did not I've tried to get into podcasts still a little uh more time constraining for me to sit and listen although I do have a really dear friend who um is working on growing a podcast called Killer Eats and she <laughs> talks about like uh the history of these serial killers and then in the background she and her husband are verbally talking about this recipe that they're making so they're like oh we're having chicken parmesan and we're going to talk about ed gein like it's really really weird so um but there she's really fun she actually has a background kind of in like broadcasting so like she and she's just very very funny uh -huh. so it's very, so it's drawing you into podcasting. It's very, yeah, it's yeah. very like lighthearted and funny. And then she she made a joke about me on one of her podcasts. So I, I promoted that <laughs> I was featured on this podcast very like, oh, you know, go see Jessica type thing. Um, but yeah. If so I, there isn't one that you would recommend then other than your no, friends. I Killer mean, Eats. Killer Mara. Eats is great. Yeah. Um, I do have a um, a former colleague of mine who has a very um, well-known podcast, Cubicle to CEO. Her name is Ellen Yin, and she was one of my initial mentors and helped me to kind of grow and scale my business in the start. And so she's a brilliant marketer, and she actually featured me on her podcast um, last month. That was exciting, um, but she's she's got a, a good formula for that. I don't know if I... Um, I was just that. curious because a lot of times people will be pretty heavily either, oh, I read books or no, no, I'm oh, totally in a podcast. I've YouTube. Like, I've been YouTube. YouTube. Yeah. I, I need YouTube. to add that to my question because I think you're probably the second person that said, or YouTube. Yeah. You know, it's funny because as far as like what I do really on my free time, a lot of it is um, just other ways to binge watch without digesting educational stuff. So I find podcasts to be very much mm -hmm. educational and informational. And they're great if that's the mindset that you're in. But usually when I want to like turn that off, I'm not looking to like hear about the best way to. You well, know. you also have a very young, <laughs> young one too. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so. She keeps me very, very busy. And I highly doubt she would allow me to watch a, a podcast or listen to a podcast um, regularly. So I do binge YouTube. And usually what I do is I pop it on the shower because um, it's the only time I get any free time. And so I just listen to the background. Like it's, it's usually about dating. I don't know why I'm not dating anyone. My husband and I have been together for a while, but it's, it's always talking about like the, the way that modern dating has is affected. Is it the humor in it or something? I don't know. I think it's just because um, 
you know, a lot of the times it's commentary on like other people who act as if they're dating experts and then mm-hmm. they get caught doing something like cheating on their spouse. I don't know why I find that so funny. Maybe it's because it's the drama element of it. I don't know. And my job doesn't usually have a lot of drama. Yeah, so I pretty need, black and white. It right? is. It can be very dry and boring. Although there are, um, there are some instances where it can get a little kind of like spicy, especially if you have a couple who's divorcing. Whew, that's... That's a whole other The outside episode. dynamic yeah, does the spice. Right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the other question is parenting advice. So one of the one of um one of our listeners was pretty pretty detailed in saying you need to ask your guests what their best parenting tip is. Um I would say don't listen to everyone. Because mm-hmm. um, it's very easy to go onto Google and say, oh, how do I do this? And you're going to get 100 different opinions. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes the experts aren't obviously in your um, your family. Di- they don't know your family dynamics. They don't know the way that you and your spouse maybe they agreed to co-parent. Or they don't know if your child maybe has special needs or just a way that they react to certain things. Mm-hmm. Um, so at some point you have to not always deter to the experts and realize that you, to a certain extent, are the expert in your own family dynamics. Um, my neighbor the other day, I have, uh, she came and, and said, you know, it'd be really nice if your kids went to bed early. You know, they keep me up all night long because we're on a second level right now. And she says she hears their little feet pitter patter. I'm like, that's actually probably my dogs, but not my kids. Um, and I was like, you know, thank you. I'll take that in consideration. And I was talking to my husband about it. And he's like, oh man, yeah, we should get the kids to bed earlier. I was like, we've been trying to get the kids to bed earlier. You know, we, we have a time change and just a lot of things changing in general. And my stance is, look, we'll just do the best that we can to make sure that the kids are not having tantrums at bedtime and it becomes a routine and an enjoyable experience. Um, but trying to get them to bed at seven o'clock at night is just not realistic for us. So even though the parenting experts might say children need 12 hours of sleep, sorry, mine are getting eight right now because that's what works for us. Trusting yourself. Yes. Trusting I agree yourself. with you. Each, each situation is so different depending on the people involved and you just moved and just all kinds of things, right? So and true. All children are different. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I can see just with my own three kids, every child is wholly unique and they have different needs from me, different needs from their dad, even different needs from each other. So my four and a half year old is like enamored with my 14 year old and he's been so good to not treat her like the annoying little sister because that can very easily fall into that trap because she just wants to hang out with him all the time and there's really not a lot they have in common. So um, he's done a great job in meeting her needs for when she needs attention from him specifically. And then the same for, you know, the baby and they just have different needs from each of their parents. And so just trying to focus on, again, the individual child has always been beneficial to my parenting style. Mm -hmm. So what am I not asking you? What, what, so our podcast listeners are women that are aspiring to six figures. Mm-hmm. And then we have a good, a pretty good amount that are already at six figures sure. and listen, cause it's their, it's their peer group. But what am I not asking that you think could add value? So in my line of work, again, I'm always about trying to minimize taxes and making sure that you have the most money in your pocket so you can do all the things that you want to do with your family. And moms have an actual edge because we can hire our children and our our children in our businesses, and um, it's a great tax strategy and it's a way to teach our children new skills, get them involved in your business, whether it be showing them how to support you in social media, or showing them how to organize things in alphabetical order. There's a million things your children can do in your business, and it benefits them in, in so many ways. They get money for you know performing a job in your business, you get a great tax break, and hopefully you're able to work with them on a new skill that maybe they wouldn't learn otherwise. That practical experience that we all try to get out on the job, Mm -hmm. it starts at home. Mm -hmm. So I think that moms have a unique advantage to get their children involved in their businesses, show them some things that they may not get out on the real world after maybe graduating college, and um, just get some life experience. It's a great, great little tip that moms get the advantage of when we have we have kids to teach. That's a great tip. I always tell people one of the, I think one of, for me, one of the biggest benefits I've seen in my business is that my daughters have watched me work. Yes. And they know 
what it looks like to create something. And um, that's one of the things that I think I'm most proud of in in that regard. So that's a fantastic tip. Um, it's interesting because my younger daughter just a couple of days ago said, I want to understand um, how you do a particular part of the business. And I was like, this is awesome that she's asking. Mm -hmm. So I think what you're talking about actually draws them into the practical side. So very, very cool. And as business owners, we have a unique opportunity, especially self-employed individuals. We have a unique opportunity to let our kids know there's other ways to be successful in a, a job. It doesn't always have to be the typical nine to five corporate job. You can have your own business, mm -hmm. but they can also see sometimes the struggle involved and that it's a lot of work and it's not always rainbows and butterflies. And, you know, in, in our case, it is it? It's, it's not. I hate to bring it to you, <laughs> but trying to explain to people the difference for, you know, where my line of work, where I have 300 bosses right. as opposed to one. Right. Um, and so, and, and you have to learn also how to report to different people and, you know, work with different personalities. I mean, I I do pride myself in that at my old firm, I worked with, I think, up to 12 different attorneys at one point, and none of them performed the work the same way. So being able to adapt to a situation where, okay, this person likes it done this way, but this person prefers this way, and not overlapping the differences and how they just perform their jobs every day um, was an important skill because now I can adapt to, again, the 300 people that I'm having to report to mm -hmm. every tax season um, that have expectations of me to complete and perform a job in a certain manner. Um, and also, you know, learning how to just deal with difficult clients in certain cases. Um, I think those problem solving skills are things that we can really teach our children because oh, yeah. not many kids have problem solving skills. We're so quick to say, oh, let me just fix this for you. You're, you're, you're feeling bad. Oh, here, let's, let's go distract you from this terrible thing that's going on in your life. And so they don't have problem solving or coping skills to help them overcome whatever adversities they're facing. So I think that's a huge thing that we as business owners and moms can teach our kids as well. Yeah, that's, that's really, really great advice. Thank you for doing this with me. Thank oh, thank you for, you for having the me. Time. What an amazing opportunity, really. I'm truly appreciative for the chance to be here. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Moms Making Six Figures podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, please take a moment and leave a review on iTunes. To learn more about Moms Making Six Figures, head over to momsmakingsixfigures.com. That's right, momsmakingsixfigures.com.